Welcome to One Decision, the show that looks at key decisions and their consequences from the perspective of those at the centre of global events. Today, we have two voices on how the world of intelligence has been rocked by the events in Ukraine. Perspectives from careers served at the CIA and Britain's MI6. Sir Richard Dearlove, formerly chief of MI6, Britain's secret intelligence service. And John Seifer, a senior veteran of the CIA. He ran the agency's Russia operations and served as chief of several stations across Europe and Asia. Did we ever meet professionally? I'm not sure we did. but I don't know if we did. I certainly know a lot about you and a lot of your people. But oh, that's good. <laughs> it's always good to avoid the brass. Anyway, I think we probably have professionally quite a lot in common over time. Yeah, this this whole thing is bringing it all back around, isn't it? It's I spent a lot of time in Russia, then I was in the Balkans for quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. And some of this actually resonates with Milosevic yeah. and all that. Well, I was in Moscow during the sort of brief honeymoon period around 9-11 on a number of visits. So I, I dealt with some of the current people who are still around, but um, that was a rather extraordinary. I don't know if you saw this recent interview with Patrushev. My gosh, he sounds insane. And I know our services have dealt with him for all these years, you know. I gave an interview a couple of days back and someone asked me about Patrushev and I said he was really one of the key Praetorian guard and really quite a sinister individual. But I used to meet him when he was head of the FSB, so I mean, I had direct dealings with him. I wanted to ask both of you something that I think has really defined this conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and that is the extraordinary series of unprecedented and really rapid intelligence disclosures, both by the US and the British governments, with regard to Russia's strategy in Ukraine. In December, there were details of Russia's plan to invade involving 175,000 troops. That was published in the Washington Post. The British government also shared details of Russian plans to install specific individuals as part of a puppet government in Kyiv. And there were also various uh, details of plans to stage false flag pretexts for war, all of this in the lead up to the invasion. So I wanted to ask both of you, uh, John, let's hear from you first. What did you make of the decision to disclose all of this intelligence at all? I mean, clearly there was quite a painful awareness of the legacy of Iraq and how intelligence right. was handled back then. But also, we also had this far more immediate failure of intelligence regarding the Taliban and Afghanistan. So do you think those previous seminal moments played a role in how Western governments handled the intelligence they received and then what they went on to do with it? Yeah, I don't know if, if those had a, played a role, but I think there's a number of things that came together. And I actually give the administration and and you know, our partners credit for for using intelligence in a more public way. And I think there's some things that allow that to happen now that, you know, in the past might not have been really gone against our culture, been tough to do. And I I think sort of the the wider uh, uh, the wider access to uh, open source intelligence, you know, there's now these you know, commercial satellite companies, there's the Bellingcats of the world, there's these companies that pull together big data. I think intelligence services now can, can you know, maybe through a sensitive source, a technical or human source, um, can be aimed to some real intelligence and then use sort of open source means to pull together information to sort of bolster their point of view and then use that. Um, so I think, it, you know, it sort of goes against the culture of my old business and, and, and Sir Richard's business, but um, I, I think, you know, the intention was originally to probably deter Putin, to get inside his head, make him realize that we are on to what he was up to. And when that didn't work, I, I do think it ended up providing, you know, really useful to sort of coalesce um, partners and allies together more than we might, more faster and more successfully than we might have otherwise. And there's some issues we need to deal with here. I mean, I think the fact that we have somebody like Bill Burns and we have this White House who have a lot of practitioners and professionals that have been involved in this for quite a long time, uh, you know, it, do, it doesn't necessarily mean in the future we're going to have administrations that are that professional. And so as long as I think the intelligence services themselves are the ultimate ones who declassify information, I think I think we'll be OK. But there are some some problems. And, and also, you know, sometimes the intelligence may be wrong, like Iraq intelligence was wrong. And it you know, it will then be seen as an effort by uh, 
Western allies to use disinformation or misinformation to to make their case when in fact you know they're just they're just wrong. I I, I totally agree. What what was your there was that really interesting, rather testy moment when a veteran AP journalist got into a little bit of a scrap with Ned Price. You're you're smiling because you already know what I'm what I'm talking about, and that's yeah. because the journalist was asking for evidence of this intelligence because we all remember in the lead up to the invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February when the US government was making these warnings they're saying Putin is going to invade Putin is going to you know employ all these tactics and not really showing the receipts yeah i mean i think journalists should always push and press for for more and that's going to be a tough thing as uh, the administration tries to figure out uh, how best to use this new tool if they're going to continue to use it and so, there, you know, there's natural friction there between obviously journalists, who, you know, who rightfully want to push to get more and more information and the government who needs to protect it. And that's why it's got to be, you know, be used judiciously. The, the notion that we, you know, use this, you know, more and more and then suggest that more and more we might put some mistaken intelligence out there. And then we're then we're in this this trouble that you mentioned, you know, with Iraq and these other type of things where it looks like the government is using information uh, or misinformation. And part of the problem here is one of the things that troubles me, I see, you know, some media outlets suggesting, oh, finally, the United States is playing in the information warfare game like the Russians do. And that that troubles me a little bit because it is a different game. The Russians can play disinformation and misinformation. Western allies, if they're going to use intelligence, have to do their best to make sure that intelligence is accurate and real. In fact, in the United States, you know, in, in our early years, you know, of the CIA in the late 40s and the 50s, we would sometimes use disinformation, misinformation around the world, but that was at a time when we could, you know, put out some false information for psyops purposes in Bangladesh or somewhere, and it would never make its way back into the Western media. Nowadays, with social media and stuff, there's no way that you that an intelligence service can put out false information and have it not get back into the the media food chain, and that's a, that's against our regulations and our laws. So, we're sort of playing a different game here. The West, if they're going to use intelligence publicly have to back it up and have to use what they believe to be accurate intelligence. And they should be very careful about that. Whereas the Russians can use it essentially as a, as a weapon, as a tool, as misinformation. And so, you know, it, you know, most people are praising the way that the administration uses it, but I think we need to be careful going forward. There are some real potholes here. You, you, you touched upon transparency and that actually leads me very nicely onto something I'd like to ask you, Richard, because you, ran the secret intelligence service in the UK. And so you are the only person um, at MI6 who is allowed to say that they used to work at MI6. Only the chief is able to be avowed as, as it's known. And so I wanted to ask you, the difference between the Russians using disinformation and all these tactics versus Western government agencies is that our agencies are ostensibly accountable. So in terms of declassification of intelligence and decisions about what you make public, how transparent was it wise to be with intelligence when you are trying to uh, inform the government, inform the public about things that are happening overseas? Well, I think I'd start by making the basic point that, you know, all intelligence is designed to be used. You collect it in order to use it. Um, the restraints on use are largely, as it were, the restraints of the collectors in order to protect sources. So, you know, every piece of intelligence has conditions attached to it. But when you get into the area <clears throat> of, as it were, use of intelligence, you're moving more into policy areas that are, to an extent, under the control of the ser services. But on the other hand, you know, you're serving the purpose of the government. Uh, and, I mean, in my experience, the, the situation in Ukraine is only unusual uh, because of the extent to which the material has been used. And in a way, that's a reflection of what John's talking about. And I agree with him absolutely. 
the, the, the sort of variability of sources and corroboration now, particularly open source intelligence, you know, allows you probably to place much more material in the public domain. Um, and it's clear, you know, the US and UK governments, I mean, this is an inference, took a decision that it was uh, a, a going to be a better policy to use this stuff and to use it broadly in order to as it were, warn Putin um, that they were informed about his intentions, but also maybe their own political audiences for the events that were to come. I mean, I must say, you know, I was uh, very surprised that Putin, whatever the preparations, actually carried out the invasion because it was such a stupid decision, as we can now see. And I thought he wouldn't take such a stupid decision, but, you know, one underestimated as it were, the motivation and pressure operating on him uh, to, to take this extraordinary step. He was grossly misled and grossly misinformed, and there's certainly evidence to suggest that that was the case. But, I mean, I can think of lots of situations which I don't particularly want to go into in detail. I mean, for example, during the Balkans War, and John you know, knew the Balkans well, I mean, during the bombing of Serbia, um, when <sighs> there was all sorts of discussions about what material should be released by Western governments um, in those circumstances, uh, because there was a feeling of urgency on the part of the United States, the UK and others, you know, that the policy was actually working. And, you know, to indicate that it was working would have needed, you would have needed to release lots of intelligence material to show that it was going to achieve its objectives. Uh, and there are so many examples going right back. I mean, the most, probably the most famous that none of you remember. I was a schoolboy in the United States at the time was the Cuba crisis. Um, you know, when the US government and, released massive amounts of material to show, you know, what the Russians were doing in Cuba and to justify, you know, taking taking the, the world to the brink of nuclear warfare. I mean, I recently found the letters I wrote as a schoolboy in the United States to my parents saying, you know, quite casually, um, you know, the, the, the belief here is that you know, nuclear war may break, break out next week. Uh, it's extraordinary, the sort of... Uh, almost naivety, you know, I was 16, 17, 18 years, I can't remember, 17 years old at the time. But it, it, so it's quite interesting to look back at those events. And I think it's important to see these events in context. And the, the crucial issue in relation to Ukraine, really, is, is the extent to which you can use the material without prejudicing your sources. And, and you know, we're outsiders, we don't know what's human, we don't know what's overhead. We don't know what's uh, intercept. We don't know what signals analysis. But I, I mean, uh, I think John and I can surmise by looking at it what might come from where. But uh, there's no question that it makes it a hell of a lot easier. Organizations like Bellingcat and then commercial satellites are taking shots, you know, which are relevant to the material. It makes it much, much easier to use it. And in a way, we are in new circumstances because. You know, it, it lets the um, services off the hook in, in, in terms of having to lay down very, very tight rules about how their intelligence is used in order to preserve the sources. I, I think social media has really changed the game because even during the Crimea invasion at the start back in 2014, when Russia was denying the whole little green men situation, they were popping up on Instagram and geotagging their location and people were, a yeah. were able to say, uh, yeah, you do have... Uh, troops or contractors or you know Russians, and they're tagging themselves inside Ukrainian territory, and and that was just extraordinary. But th I think that's interesting. You point to the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, to say that a lot of these intelligence disclosures is nothing new, and I just wanted to ask, you know, some of the things that we've learned um, that. Uh, for example, the head of GCHQ, one of the UK's intelligence agencies, he recently made a speech at an Australian university and he, re he said, we've seen Russian soldiers short of weapons and morale refusing to carry out orders, sabotaging their own equipment and even accidentally shooting down their own aircraft. Uh, and he already he also made the point of how extraordinary the intelligence disclosures have been in this war. Uh, those were extraordinary. Do you find that, well, that information extraordinary? Uh, in a way, yes, but in a way, no, because I think what happened 
was that the Russian um, cipher communications didn't really work particularly well. And I mean, I, I'm guessing now, but you know, what was happening was that they were using mobile phones um, that everybody, you know, with any capability was listening to the mobile phone conversations and what you were hearing from the head of GCHQ probably was extremely well corroborated by people using open source, um, you know, because if, if your cipher systems fail you or don't work, and some of this material, if you're not used to using it or it's not being used, can be quite clunky and, and difficult. And remember, you're in a battlefield situation. You're going to say, oh, hell, I'm in a, you know, and you pick your mobile phone up because they've all got mobile phones and start talking on them. And um, I, I'm, I, I, that, I'm just giving you a hypothetical explanation, which, 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 which my, I see John is nodding his head. And I think that's a possible explanation. On, yeah, on the other hand, it's pretty extraordinary for the head of GCHQ to stand up and say something like that. But, I mean, the reason he said it is probably because he could say it because of the special circumstances of what was happening in Ukraine. It was chaotic by all accounts. And we know that some of the armoured columns, they couldn't communicate. And the officers were getting out of their mobile phones and talking to each other. And, and shortwave and, radio yeah. that was being picked up by Ukrainians of and course, posted on social yeah. media as well. I can yeah. think of two things here. I think one, it's sort of unusual that the head of GCHQ would put this out is, is, is perhaps even to message to Putin, right? So if we truly believe, you know, he's like Stalin in the lead up to World War II, he's not, people are telling him what he wants to hear. He's had this dictatorship for years. Everybody knows what he believes and they're going to tell him what he believes. You know, by putting this information out there, you, you guarantee it's going to be getting to the leadership in the, in the Kremlin. And so I think some of that's happening. And I think, again, I've, I've been out of the agency for a few years now, and I don't have access to secrets. But I think someday we may find out that some of our, our special operators and, and cyber slews and NSA folks and others have done some work here to make it harder for the Russians to do some of the things that they have wanted to do. Therefore, they've had to communicate in a way that's been easier to pick up by, by others. And so, yeah, I, you know, I think there's a method to sort of the madness of putting out some of this information because they're trying to get it to, into Putin's head. Can I suppose that given all of these intelligence disclosures and all these predictions about what Putin was going to do, do you think maybe it's possible that given the number of experts such as such as yourself, Richard, who really did not think that Putin would make such a strategic blunder as to actually launch an invasion. Do you think maybe that wasn't ever his intention until the West sort of called his bluff and to not have launched an invasion may have made it look like he had bottled it? <laughs> That's a good question, but I, I really don't think so. I mean, I, I, what, what I think, what I thought was that his strategic objective was to bite off more of a Luhansk and and, and 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 the Donbass, which is in fact where we've ended up, is that's exactly what they're now trying to do because they failed in the broader objective. But I think the broader objective was the primary objective originally. It was to change the government in Ukraine and to put in a government that was, you know, sympathetic to the Russians. So the, there's no question that you know if if, if you're suffering from serious post-imperial angst, the loss of Ukraine to the West is for the Russians of fundamental importance if you're trying to preserve the whole concept of, of, of the Russias the, in the plural. I mean, bearing in mind that, you know, a lot of Russian identity, you know, historically is actually attached to Kiev and, and, and uh, uh, the, the sort of culture of Ukraine. So th this is for them. I, I mean, I'm not trying to sort of explain the Russian case, but there is a sort of seminal issue of identity here as far as Russia goes. Um, and, you know, that Ukraine is becoming a democratic country and joining, as it were, the Western tradition and, 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 and moving out of Moscow's orbit. It's, it's fundamental to their their greater identity. I think it shows Putin's mania that if you think about the need to have Kiev drawn closer to Moscow, it, the fact that it never occurred to them to do that by actually working with Ukraine, by actually <laughs> trying to be a, a good partner with Ukraine as opposed to needing to destroy it and take it over. And so 
when you have that mentality, there's not much, there's not much option. I, you know, I think we all agree that, you know, his actions are mad. They've, they've, they've achieved just the opposite of all the things that he's wanted. He wants the U S out of Europe. He wants NATO dead. He wants Ukraine to be, you know, essentially a, a vassal of, of Russia, if not part of Russia, all of those things are, have been, knocked away you know it's going to be in ukrainian textbooks for years and years the heroic ukraine fighting off you know being taken over by the the russians and and nato's in a better state than it's been in, in years and years and there's more american troops in ukraine than there's been in years and so i you know i like sir richard i i just thought you know i always i always acknowledge it as i'm a westerner and therefore my mentality is some such that it's idiotic to invade but you know here we are and and you know, Putin, Putin's done this. He's got this strange view of history and geography. And, you know, Russia's never really come to terms with this repressive past. It's always been a expansionist kind of power. It's never really, a, you know, real Russia with, with clear and stable borders for a long period of time has not existed. But I think few of us thought that he would go to, to this extent. Yeah, I think the, the civilian term for what he's done is called an own goal here in the UK. Um, <laughs> on that topic, John, you you recently revised an assessment you made a few years ago um, that Putin was more a product of his KGB background than acting in the longer cultural and historical tradition of Russian czars and Soviet party bosses. And I think you, you wrote this on the Cypher Brief website. And you said that you revised this because in recent years, he has increasingly acted in a nationalist, in a nationalist and I would argue, imperialist manner. Uh, talk to me about your thinking on that. Yeah, I mean, early on, I, I sort of looked at him and I saw him as someone who is, you know, he was, he, I tend to see him, his mentality as this Czechist mentality, the mentality of a Russian intelligence officer, you know, this proud use of subversion and sabotage and assassination, all the sort of, you know, dirty tricks of of the KGB. And I, I thought that is the, the main thing that sort of impels him and, 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 and makes him thinking. But we've seen in the last couple of years, He's moved much more to some of these sort of traditional Russian views. He's following some of these older Russian philosophers about this need for this sort of great, great Russia and uh, all these type of things. So that, you know, I, I thought as a KGB officer, he was using Russian history just to sort of keep the people on moving forward, to sort of make himself appear sort of the, the modern czar, what have you. But in, recently, I think it's 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 more than that. We're seeing essentially the same kind of same kind of mentality as the both the, the communist commissars and the Russian czars. Yeah, so I mean, we recently spoke to a Lithuanian lawmaker, Matas Maldekis, and he said something very interesting. He thinks that Russia slash Putin has a messianic complex. And he mentioned this, this theory called the Third Rome Theory, and this thinking that first there was Rome, then there was Constantinople, and then Moscow is going to be the the center of civilization. And it sounds wacky. That's an old, it no, sounds no, it's an old theory. But do you think that people in, in Russia, and do you think Putin himself could actually subscribe to this? Uh, yeah, I think there's always been this sort of messianic streak in Russian sort of mentality and, and foreign policy. And, and, and some of it is is due to, you know, What's happened to them historically? You know, it it's a, a large, massive landmass that has few borders that can that are sort of naturally protect them, and so they've had Mongol invasions, native invasions by the Nazis and others and such. So their notion, you know, they can never be strong enough. They can never defend themselves enough against you know potential outside threats, um, and so they've all they've they protected themselves by essentially growing and and invading others and making sure countries on their periphery are sort of vassal states. And, you know, writers like George Kennan and others have constantly said this, you know, if, if you're if you're a neighbor of Russia, you're either an enemy or a vassal. You can't be anything other. You know, if you're not one, you're the other. And so some of this stuff is very Russian. You know, the, the, some of the, you know, the Russian, you know, 19th century was, was similar. They had, you know, a czar who was had full control and wanted to you know, move its move its borders, you know, further to the west and, and to the east back then. And so some of this stuff is is, you know, is is a is a Russian mentality. But you know, we often think that you know history moves in a not always in an upward direction, but sort of generally in an upward direction. And, and we think that at, at this point, 
in modernity, you know, it would be easier to understand where threats are coming from, and it would be easier to understand the importance of an economy and the strength of a of a country's uh, national security and these type of things. And so, the fact that so much of this is sort of backward looking is really, really kind of uh, troubling. Yeah, I think if Russia was prospering, these issues would not be as evident as they are today. I mean, there's no question that. I mean, I said. It, to you before that, you know, we're, we're in a period of post-imperial decline, which in a way, you know, the British probably recognised themselves. We, we've been through the process and as it were, re-accommodated ourselves in, in a different world, you know, with a different global vision of what the country might be. But I, I think that Russia is still hanging on to these sort of historic concepts that John describes so well and so accurately. And there's no question that, you know, the way that Russia has over time, and this goes right back to the Tsars, assured its security, is, you know, by destabilizing and dominating the nations on its periphery. And you know, as you say, they're either enemies or they're vast mistakes controlled by the Russians. And, you know, they haven't had secure borders in the sense that you know, we would understand them. And uh, I, I think that because of Russia's political economic uh, decline from this extraordinary period of the Soviet Union, which in the post-war period, you know, is it, so unique in Russian history when it dominated so much of Europe. Um, it, it, anyone who's sort of knowledgeable about Russia's past would almost understand this crisis that they're going through. And I think what's happened in Ukraine is an extreme expression of this, this anxiety. Maybe with a different set of leaders, it wouldn't have happened um, because they would have made the judgment that this was a step too far. But I mean, it seems that Putin has failed to make that connection himself. And he is no question, you know, dominant. Um, and I think that's what's worrying the current situation is, is the, the irrationality of his decision making and, and the weakness of Russia at the moment and the failure of its military, I think, makes them more dangerous than if they were being successful. Like that cornered rat that he famously mentioned in, in that interview yeah. that people are bringing up again and again. One thing I wanted to get um, of your reaction to was... Um, the uh, dispelling of more than 300 Russian diplomatic and embassy staff from various US embassies since the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and many of them uh, were ordered after the killings and atrocities were reported in the town of Bucha. Uh, German intelligence sources informed German media that those due to be expelled from that country included people who posed a direct threat to Ukrainian activists based in Germany, as well as thousands who had arrived as refugees. And so the Germans, they expelled around 40 Russians in total. But I read that various assessments of the true number of German spies operating, uh, of Russian spies operating in Germany, numbers up to 2,000. France, Spain and a few other EU nations expelled a dozen, a few dozen uh, 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 Russians from their embassies. So I wanted to ask, are these expulsions, I mean, we saw similar moves during the Skripal incident here in England. Are they mostly symbolic, uh, given that the number of expulsions likely dwarfs the number of actual Russian spies in any country during a particular moment in time? Or do those expulsions do actually, do they have a tangible impact on Russian intelligence operations in Europe? I think usually I don't think they have a large impact. I, there's been a few times in history where enough operatives were kicked out that it, that it was tough for the other side. I think when Margaret Thatcher kicked out a, a after I think the Gordievsky, I, I can't remember. I think it was after the Gordievsky um, defection, a bunch of Ru Russian diplomats and intelligence officers in London, and I think that had sort of a, an effect on Russia's intelligence. But in general, the Russians are, are much more focused on these things. You know, Putin's a career KGB officer. The KGB was the sword and shield of the Soviet state. Um, intelligence, covert intelligence. Offensive intelligence is a much more central part of the Russian state than it is of Western states. It's not. It's not just collection and analysis. It's, it's also these, this covert um, active measures of 
subversion and sabotage and deception and assassination, all these other kind of things that they're trying, disinformation that they're trying to push. And so I think the, the Russian state relies on their operatives more than most Western states do. In fact, you know, the United States is probably the bit largest and, and richest country in the history of the world. And we probably have fewer intelligence officers around the world than, than Russia does. And there's far more Russian intelligence officers in the United States than there are intelligence officers, Western intelligence officers in Moscow, for example. And so in the past, when we've had these tit for tat expulsions, you know, I think our political leadership thinks we're, we're striking a blow. And I, I think professionals realize that rarely works that way because the Russians often respond, they take it more seriously and they respond in kind. And so we end up often suffering more than the Russians do, even though we're trying to punish them. And so I think in this case, however, the fact that Putin's gone so far out um, that there's probably more appetite in the West to deal, to look at the real problem, look at what the Russians have been up to, interfering in elections, supporting violent right-wing groups, uh, spreading disinformation, weaponizing oil, weaponizing information, all these other kind of things that I think there's more of an appetite to, to push out some of these intelligence operatives. Like, but you said, like, you got to look at the numbers and you got to look at exactly who's there and who's not there. I suspect that there's plenty of Russian intelligence officers still in Europe and in Germany and these kind of places. Um, so, so forty may sound like a lot, but it's probably not a lot in this case. Well, there are there have always been these sort of mass expulsions. I mean, the UK in the sixties expelled a hundred KGB officers. I, and uh, you know, K KGB and GRU. GRU is the military intelligence organization. Um, when I was on post in Paris in the eighties, the, uh, uh, the the French. Security Service identified and chucked out, I think, 60 from France. Um, and I mean, John's right that the, the Russians have large numbers of these people, mostly in diplomatic or quasi-diplomatic establishments undercover. And, you know, some of them are GRU, some of them are, 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 are SVR, what was the first chief director of the KGB. Um, and I mean, it is disruptive. And it also denies these people a very nice lifestyle in the West. <laughs> uh, and a lot of it, you know, it, it, it's very annoying if you're a Russian intelligence officer living in Switzerland with your family, having nice outings to Swiss restaurants and going skiing and everything, suddenly to find yourself back in a dingy little flat in Moscow. So the, there's, there's no question that it does have a, a personal impact on individuals and their families. And, uh, uh, but, you know, it's been going on for a long time. And every time there's a crisis in relations with Russia, you know, we hit back and, 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 and chuck a lot of them out. The, the difficulty then comes from them because they want to reciprocate and they chuck, but they're mostly chucking out real diplomats from the embassies because they've run out of intelligence personnel. Does that make uh, it easier for defections? Um, just that clash in, cult in lifestyles you mentioned? Well, uh, you know, there are all sorts of reasons for, for, for defections. Um, and th there's no question that during a period of political crisis as we're going through now with Russia, there will be individual Russians who are deeply disturbed by what is happening in Ukraine. And I very much hope, and I'm sure that John does, that our former services are making, making hay, as it were. Maybe that's an inappropriate simile, if you, but you see what I mean. <laughs> um, but, but, I mean, for example, that during the period of uh, uh, invasion of, 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 of Czechoslovakia by the Russians in, in, in 68, there were a number of very significant intelligence recruitments by the West because of, you know, Russians disapproving ideologically of what the hell was going on and it'll be happening again for sure you're not biting on what i'm really asking which is how many russians have you uh led to defect richard but anyways <laughs> can... no comment <laughs> hey the one the one thing we want to point out is that the, the goal of of western intelligence services is not to have them defect it's to have them exactly. to go back and, and work in place a you defection is, is useful for a period of time depending on the information they have but then it, sort of peters out. What you want to do is you want people for personal motivations, personal reasons, to stay in place and report and work their way up the chain so that someday you have people in, in 
you know, senior positions that can provide you the sort of warning that you need, you know, for, for these type of things. And so, and I think that's one of the reasons you see people like Skripal, the Russians try to kill someone like Sergei Skripal with, with a weapons grade nerve agent. So they know, you know, if, if it works and the nerve agent goes out of his body, people will suspect it's the Russians. If it doesn't work and you figure out what it is, it sends a signal to everybody in, in the Russian foreign ministry and intelligence services that, yeah, yeah, play footsie with the West, but at some point we're coming for you and we'll we'll kill you and your family no matter how long you've been away. And so in the old days, they sort of had ideology, Soviet ideology, communist ideology to back up. Now, when the leadership is corrupt and they're all making tons of money and everybody's sort of taking their cut, you know, they, they have to sort of rule by fear. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing some of these assassination attempts. Mm. A, a defection in allegiance, I guess, is the, is the ideal scenario. Back to the intelligence disclosures. Do you think that has set a new bar for what, what's going to happen in future conflicts? I'm sure it establishes a, a pattern that, you know, for reasons we've already discussed, it may be easier in the future to use intelligence in this manner. But I mean, I think the basic rules still apply, and that is protection of sources and um, the extent to which, you know, the collectors insist on certain rules. And it's usually the collectors that do have this word uh, or the, this authority that, you know, how their material is used because they, they understand the risk to the sources. So if you've got corroboration, then you can be pretty free and easy with it wherever it comes from. And uh, the, the, the frequency of corroboration because of social media, the internet, OSINT, open source intelligence, uh, it's going to be much greater in the future than it's been in the past. I think, I think that some of that's going to depend on the seriousness of politicians that we elect. Uh, um, I think this administration is like a traditional administration in the United States, has professional national security operatives. But I worry about, a, a you know, a Donald Trump winning again. And so if they believe that, hey, you know, previous administrations used intelligence publicly, there's no reason why we shouldn't do it. And we're seeing hints that, you know, the administration in its last days were often trying to mess with the uh, director of national intelligence and the CIA and the FBI to try to use it for their own personal and partisan purposes. And I worry about that. On that, given how uh, various parts of the US government declassified sources to the FBI, informants, I'm referring to specifically to people who were unmasked in relation to the Steele dossier inquiry. Do you think that that has damaged um, America's ability to recruit sources and the CIA's ability to, to, to get human intelligence from sources who will be risking their lives for a government who may not be able to guarantee that their identities will always be protected? I think the unmasking was, were those, these were FBI sources or, or, or um, CIs, I call them confidential informants, or whatever, which is a little different than the way the CIA and, and and foreign intelligence services run their, their sources. But yes, I mean, whenever this comes out publicly, who's going to want to, you know, work for a Western intelligence service if you worry that it can it can become public any day or it's going to be taken for partisan purposes as opposed to, you know, national security purposes for the reason you're you're working. So yeah, I I, I do think, you know, we saw uh, in the previous administration, uh, some of these important protections starting to sort of wear away. Yeah, you do not want the integrity of your services to be damaged and prejudiced over time. That's important. On that ominous note, I think we're out of time. But John, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. And thank you, Richard, for joining us. And thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of One Decision. We'll have a new one for you every Thursday. From me and the team, see you next time.